Shalom, shalom, everybody. Shalom, everybody. Next up, we're going to read Law 28, uh, the first, I mean, not the first 48, of the uh, 48 Laws of Power. Law 28 of the 48 Laws of Power uh, by Robert Greene, a Joyce Elford book. Law 28 will be interaction with boldness. Interaction with boldness. A dictionary. In, in pencil ready. Let's get it. Interaction with boldness. Judgment. If you are unsure of a course of action, do not attempt it. Your doubts and hesitations will infect your execution. <laughs> Your doubts and hesitations will infect your execution. Timidity is dangerous. Better to enter with boldness. Any mistakes you commit through audacity are easily corrected with more audacity. Everyone admires the bold. No one honors the timid. Boldness and hesitation, a brief psychological comparison. Boldness and hesitation, hesitation elicit very different psychological responses in their targets. Hesitation puts obstacles in your path. Boldness eliminates them. Once you understand this, you will find it essential to, to overcome your natural timidity and practice the art of audacity. The following are among the most pronounced psychological effects of boldness and timidity. The bolder the lie, the better. We all have weaknesses and our efforts are never perfect, but entering action with boldness has the magical effect of hiding our deficiencies. Con artists know that the bolder the lie, the more convincing it becomes. The sheer audacity of the story makes it more credible, distracting attention from its in inconsistencies. When putting together a con or entering any kind of negotiation, go further than you plan. Ask for the moon and you will be surprised how often you get it. Lions circle the hesitant prey. People have a sixth sense for weakness of others. If in the first encounter, you demonstrate your willingness to compromise, back down and retreat, you bring out the lion even in people who are not necessarily bloodthirsty. Everything depends on perception. And once you are seen as the kind of person who quickly goes on the defensive, who is willing to negotiate and be amiable, you will be pushed around without mercy. Boldness strikes fear. Fear creates authority. The bold move makes you seem larger and more powerful than you are. If it comes suddenly with the stealth and swiftness of a snake, it inspires that much more fear, that much more fear. By intimidating with a bold move, you establish a precedent. In every subsequent encounter, people will be on the defensive in terror of your next strike. Going halfway with half a heart digs a deeper grave. Going halfway with half a heart digs a deeper grave. If you enter an action with less than total confidence, you set up obstacles in your own path. When a problem arises, you will grow confused, seeing options where there are none and inadvertently creating more problems still. Retreating from the hunter, the timid hare scurries more easily into its snares. Hesitation creates gaps. Boldness obliterates them. When you take time to think, to him and haw, 
You create a gap that allows others time to think as well. Your timidity infects people with awkward energy and Ill elicits embarrassment. Doubt springs up on all sides. Boldness destroys such gaps. The swiftness of the move and the energy of the action leave others no space to doubt and worry. In seduction, hesitation is fatal. It makes your victim conscious of your intentions. The bold move crowns seduction with triumph. It leaves no time for reflection. Audacity separates you from the herd. Hmm. Boldness gives you your excuse me. Boldness gives you presence and makes you seem larger than life. The timid fade into the wallpaper. The bold draw attention, and what draws attention draws power. What cannot I mean? We cannot keep our eyes off the audacious. We cannot wait to see their next bold move. Hmm. Observance of the law. Observance number one. In May of 1925, five of the most successful dealers in the French scrap metal business found themselves invented, invited to an official but highly co confidential meeting with the deputy director, <laughs> director general of the Ministry of Post and Telegrams at the Hilton at the Hotel Krillin. Then the most luxurious hotel in Paris. When the businessmen arrived, it was the director general himself, a Monsieur Lustin, who met them in a swank suit on the top floor. The businessman had no idea why they had been summoned to this meeting, and they were bursting with curiosity with curiosity. After drinks, the director explained. Gentlemen, he said, this is an urgent matter that requires complete secrecy. The government is going to have to tear down the Eiffel Tower. The dealers listened in stunned, listened in stunned silence as the director explained that the tower, as recently re reported in the news, desperately needed repairs. It had originally been meant as a temporary structure for the exposition of 1889. The Exposition of 1889. Its maintenance costs had soared over the years, and now, in a time of the fiscal crisis, the government would have to spend millions to fix it. Many Parisians considered the Eiffel Tower an eyesore, and it would be and would be delighted to see it go. Over time, even the tourists would forget about it. It would live on the photographs and postcards. Shalom, man. I'm sorry. Shalom. Gentlemen, Lutzwick said, you are all invited to make the government an offer for the Eiffel Tower. He gave the businessmen sheets of government stationery filled with figures, such as a tonnage of the tower's, the tower's metal. Their eyes popped as they calculated how much they could make from the scrap. Then Luxwick led them to a waiting limo, which brought them to the Eiffel Tower. Flashing an official badge, he guided them through the area, spicing his tour with the amusing and it, uh, with the amusing anecdotes. with the amusing anecdotes. After the end of the visit, he thanked them and asked them to have their offers delivered by them to his suite within four days. Several days after the offers were submitted, one of the five of a Monsieur P received notice that his bid was the winner and that to secure the sale, he should come to the suite of the hotel in two days, bearing a certified check for the for more than two hundred and fifty thousand francs, the equivalent today of about a, uh, one million dollars, a quarter of the total price. On delivery of the check, he would receive the documents confirming his ownership of the Eiffel Tower. Monsieur P was excited. 
he would he would go down in history as a man who had bought and torn down the infamous landmark. But by, by the time he had arrived at the suite, check in hand, he was beginning to have doubts about the whole affair. Why meet at the hotel instead of the government building? Why hadn't he heard from other officials? Was this a hoax, a scam? As he listened to Lutzwick discuss the arrangements for the scrapping of the tower, he hesitated and con contemplated backing out. Suddenly, however, he realized that the director had changed his tone. Instead of talking about the tower, he was complaining about his low salary, about his wife's desires for a fur coat, about how, about how galling, 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 G A L L I N G, galling, galling, G L G L L. Yeah, I don't see a gall in They have a gall, though. Gall. An injury caused by a chronic scab, a chronic chafing, a cause of intense irritation, impertinence, bile, the gallbladder, or number two, to chafe, to become sore through chafing. He was complaining about his low salary, about his wife, his wife's desire for a fur coat, about how chafing it was to work hard. Go. Galling's not in there. About how galling it was to work hard and be unappreciated. It dawned on Monsieur P that this high government official was asking for a bribe. The effect on him, though, was not outrage but relief. Now he was sure that Lutzwick was for real, since in all of his previous encounters with French bureaucrats, they have, in, in it, he, they have inevitably asked for a little greeting of the palm. His confidence restored, Monsieur P slipped the director several thousand francs in billing, then handed him the certified check. In return, he received a documentation, including an, a, an impressive looking bill of sale. He left the hotel dreaming of the profits and fame to come. Over the next few days, however, as Monsieur P waited for co correspondence from the government, he began to realize that something was amiss. A few telephone calls. There was no plans to destroy the Eiffel Tower. The Eiffel Tower. He had been blinked. He had been blinked of over two hundred and fifty thousand francs. Blinked. Built. He had been built. 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 I think that's like bamboozled. Built. B i l k d. Built. Let's see. B I L K. Bilk. B I L K. Bilk. Bilk to defraud a creditor by avoiding payment of one's debts to evade, give someone the slip. <laughs> built, to give someone the slip. Boy, you got built. Pooh, he built them. Choo, that boy built them. What did choo is in He had been built, or he had been given the slip 
of over 250,000 francs. He had been evaded <laughs> or he had been defrauded, built of 250,000 francs. Monsieur P never went to the police. He knew what kind of reputation he he knew what kind of reputation he would get if word got out that he had fallen for one of the most absurdly audacious cons in history. Besides the public humiliation, it would have been business suicide. Interpretation. Had Count Victor Lutzwick Con artist extraordinaire tried to sell the Arc de, Tri de Tri Triumph, a bridge over the Seine, uh, a statue of, of Balzac. No one would have believed him, but the Eiffel Tower was just too large, too Im Im improbable, too improbable to be part of a con job. In fact, it was so improbable that Lutzwick was, a, was able to return to Paris six months later and resell the Eiffel Tower to a different scrap dealer uh, for a higher price. Damn, a sum in francs equivalent today over, uh, over $1.5 million. Ooh. That boy made 2.5. 2.5 million. Off of trying to sell the Eiffel Tower. Off of selling. <sighs> Largeness of scale deceives the human eye. It distracts and awes us. And it is so uh, it is so self-evident that we cannot imagine there is an, any illusion or deception afoot. Arm yourselves with bigness and boldness. Stretch your deceptions as far as they will go and then go further. If you sense that the sucker has suspicions, do as the intrepid Luxor did. Instead of backing down or lowering his price, he simply raised his price higher by asking for and getting, uh, getting the, a bribe. Asking for more puts another person on the defensive, cuts out the nibbling effect of compromise and doubt, and overwhelms with its boldness. Observance two. On his deathbed in 1533, Vasily III, the Grand Duke of Moscow and ruler of the semi-united Russia, proclaimed his three-year-old son Ivan IV as his, as his successor. He appointed his young wife, Helena, a regent until Ivan reached his, his majority and could rule on his own. The aristocracy, the... Boyers secretly rejoiced. For years, the Dukes of Moscow had been trying to extend their authority over the Boyers' turf. With Vasily dead, his heir, a mere three-year-old, and a young woman in charge of the dukedom, the Boyers would be able to roll back, <laughs> roll back the Duke's gains, wrest control of the state, and humiliate the royal family. Aware of these dangers, young Helena turned to her trusted friend, Prince Ivan Ob uh, Obolinsky, Obol uh, Obolinsky, Ivan Obolinsky, her help to rule, to help her rule. But after five years as regent, she suddenly died, poisoned by a member of the Sushki family, uh, the most fearsome boyer clan, the Shushki princess seized control of the government and threw Obolinsky in prison, where he starved to death at the age of eight. Ivan was now a deposed orphan, and any boyer or family member who took an interest in him was immediately banished or killed. And so Ivan roamed the palace, hungry, ill-clothed, and often hiding from the Shuskis, who treated him roughly when they saw him. On some days, he would search him out, Oh, excuse me. On some days, they would search him out, clothe him in royal, royal robes, hand him a scepter, and set him on the throne, a kind of mock ritual in which they lampooned his royal pretensions. They would shoo him away, one every, some, one every several of them chasing the Metropolitan. 
the head of the Russian church, through the palaces, and he sought refuge in Ivan's room. The boy watched in horror as the Shushkis entered, hurled insults, and beat the Metropolitan mercilessly. Ivan had one friend in the palace, a boyar named Vorontsov, Vorin, who, who consoled and advised him. One day, however, as he, Vorontsov, and the newest Metropolitan conferred in the palace uh, uh, refectory, several Shushkis burst in, beat up Vorontsov, and insulted the Metropolitan by tearing and treading on his robes. They then banished Vorontsov from Moscow. Throughout all this, Ivan maintained a strict silence. To the warriors, it seemed that their plan had worked. The young man had turned into a terrified and obedient idiot. They could ignore him now, even leave him alone. But on the evening of December 29, 1543, Ivan, now 13, asked Prince Andrei Shushki to come to his room. When the prince arrived, the room was filled with the palace guards. Young Ivan then pointed his finger at, at Andrei and ordered the guards to arrest him have him killed and throw his body to the bloodhounds of the royal kennel. Over the next few days, Ivan had all of Andre's close associates arrested and banished. Caught off guard by his sudden boldness, the boyers now stood uh, uh, in mortal terror of this youth, the future Ivan the Terrible, who had, been, who had planned and waited for five years to execute this one swift and bold act that would secure his power for decades to come. Interpretation. The world is full of warriors, men who despise you, fear your ambition, and jealousy guard their shrinking realms of power. You need to establish your authority and gain respect, but the moment the warriors sense your growing boldness, they will act to thwart it. This is how Ivan met such a situation. He lay low, showing neither ambition nor discontent. He waited, and when the time came, he brought the palace guards over to his side. The guards, who came to hate the cruel Shuskis, once they agreed to Ivan's plan, he struck with the swiftness of a snake, pointing his finger at the Shuskis and giving him no time to react. Negotiate with a warrior, and you create opportunities for him. A small compromise between a toe, I mean, becomes a toehold. He needs a small compromise becomes a toehold he needs to tear you apart. The sudden bold move without discussion or warning uh, obliterates these toeholds and builds your authority. You terrify doubters and despisers and gain a, conf a confidence of the many who admire and glorify those who act boldly. Observance number two. In 1514, 22-year-old Pietro Aritoni, 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 Pietro, Pietro Artoni was working as a lowly assistant scullion. Scullion. What is a scullion? A scullion. It might be like a waiter. Scullion. S C U L L I O N. Scullion. S C U L L. S C U L L I. It's not in here. Now I want to know what it is. A scullion to a wealthy Roman family. He had the year Pope Leo the Tenth received uh, received ah, that year. Pope Leo the Tenth received from the King of Portugal an embassy that included many gifts. Most prominent among them, a great elephant, the first in Rome since imperial times. The pontiff adored this elephant and showered it with attention and gifts. But despite his love and care, the elephant, which was called Hanno, 
became deadly, deathly ill, the Pope summoned doctors who administered a 500 pound purgative to the elephant, but to no avail. The animal died and the Pope went into mourning. To console himself, he summoned the great painter Raphael and ordered him to create a life-size painting of Hanu above the animal's tomb, bearing the inscription, what nature took away, Raphael has with, with his art restored. Over the next few days, a pamphlet circulated throughout Rome that caused great merriment, merriment and laughter, entitled The Last Will and Testament of the Elephant Hannah. It read in part, to my heir, the Cardinal Santa Croce, I give my knees so that he can Im imitate my genuflections. Let's see how many miles that word. Or genuflections, genuflections, G-E-N. U-F-L-E-C-T-I-O-N, genuflections or genuflections, which is genuflections, gena. Genus, genus, G-E-N-U-F, it's not in here. Let me get my dictionary. G E N U F L E C T I O N S. Geniflections. <sighs> to the to my heir, Cardinal Santa the Quattro, I give my jaws so that he can more readily devour all the Christ all of Christ's revenues. <laughs> To the heir, Cardinal Medici, I give my ears so that he can hear everyone's doings. To Cardinal Grassi, who had the reputation for uh, lechery, the elephant bequeathed the appro appropriate oversized part of his own anatomy for lechery, lechery. Grassy, who had the reputation for lechery, L-E-C-H-E-R-Y, lechery. L -E. Lechery. Lechery. Letter, letter, letter. Gross indulgence in carnal pleasure. To Carlo de Grassi, who had a reputation for gross indulgence in carnal pleasure or a reputation for lechery, the elephant bequeathed the appropriate oversized part of his own anatomy. On and on the, the anonymous pamphlet went, sparing, sparing none of the great of Rome, in Rome. <laughs> Not even the Pope. With each one, it took aim at their best knowledge. The pamphlet ended with verse. See to it that Artino is your friend, for he is a bad enemy to have. His words alone can ruin the high Pope, so God guard everyone from his tongue. Interpretation with one short planet, I mean pamphlet, Artino, Artino, son of a poor shoemaker and a servant himself, hurled himself to fame. Everyone in Rome rushed to find out who this daring young man was. Even the Pope, amused by his audacity, sought him out and ended up giving him a job in the papal service. Over the years, he came to be known as the scourge of princes, and his biting tongue earned him the respect and fear of the great. For the king of France to, uh, from the king of France to the Habsburg emperor, the arterial strategy is simple. When you are as small and obscure as David was, you must you must find the Goliath to attack. 
The larger the target, the more attention you gain. The bolder the attack, the more you stand out from the crowd and the more admiration you earn. Society is full of those who think dare, who think daring thoughts but lack the guts to print and publicize them. Voice what the public feels. The expression of shared feelings is always powerful. Search out the most prominent targets possible and sling your bold, your boldest shot. The world will enjoy and will honor the, un the underdog, you. This is with glory and power. That is with glory and power, my bad. Keys to power. Most of us are timid. We want to avoid tension and conflict and we want to be liked by all. We may contemplate a bold action, but we rarely bring it to, uh, we rarely bring it to light. We are terrified of the consequences, of what others may think of us, of the hostility we will stir up if we dare go beyond our, our usual place. Although we may disguise our timidity as a concern for others, a desire not to hurt or offend them, in fact, it is the opposite. We are really self-absorbed, worried about ourselves and how others perceive us. Boldness, on the other hand, is outer directed clearly in seduction. All great seducers succeed through effrontery, 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 E-F-F-R-O-N-T-E-R-Y, effrontery, effrontery, effrontery. E F F O R T F front F front E F F E F F R O E F F R Not in here. Effrontery. Casanova's boldness was not revealed in his daring approach to the women he desired or intrepid words to flatter her. It consisted in his ability to surrender himself to her completely and to make her, make her believe he would do anything for her, even risk his life, which in fact he, he sometimes did. The woman on whom he lavished his attention understood that he held nothing back from her. This was infinitely more flattering than compliments. At no point during the seduction would he show hesitation or doubt simply because he never felt it. Part of the charm of being seduced is that it makes us feel engulfed, temporarily outside of ourselves and usual, and usual, and usual doubts that permeate our lives. The moment the seducer hesitates, the charm is broken because we become aware of the process, of their deliberate efforts to seduce us, of their self-consciousness. Boldness directs attention outward and keeps the illusion alive. It never induces awkwardness or embarrassment. Boldness directs attention outward and keeps the illusion and, and drives us outside our realm in awkwardness and uh, in inwardness and reflection. Few are born bold. Even Napoleon had to cultivate the habit on the battlefield. But every part of his life, because he saw its tremendous power, how it could literally enlarge a man, even one who, like Napoleon, was in fact conspicuously small. We also see this change in Ivan the Terrible. A harmless boy suddenly transforms himself into a powerful young man who demand, who commands authority simply by pointing a finger and taking bold action. You may you must practice. You must practice and develop your boldness. You must practice and develop your boldness. You will often find uses for it. The best place to begin is often the delicate world of negotiation.
You must practice your boldness. Let's see my back. You must practice and develop your boldness. You will often find uses for it. The best place to begin is often the delicate world of negotiation. Particularly those discussions in which you are asked to set your own price. How often we put ourselves down by asking for too little. We, uh, when Christopher Columbus proposed that the Spanish count, the Spanish court finance his voyage to the Americas, he also made the insanely bold demand that he be called Grand Admiral of the Ocean. The court agreed. The price he set was the price he received, and he demanded to be treated with respect, and so he was. Henry Kissinger, to, uh, too, knew that in negotiation, bold demands work better than were bold demands that in negotiation, bold demands were better than starting off with, with piecemeal uh, concessions and trying to meet the other, the other person halfway. Huh. Set your value high. And then, as Count Luxwood did, set it higher. The boy sold life and tower. Understand, if boldness is not natural, neither is timidity. It is an it is an acquired habit, picked up out of the desire to avoid conflict. If timidity has taken hold of you, then root it out. If timidity has taken hold of you, then root it out. Your fears of the consequences of the bold action are way out of proportion to reality. In fact, the consequences of timidity are worse. Your value is lowered and you create a self-fulfilling cycle of doubt and disaster. Remember, the problems created by the, audacity, the, the audacious move can be disguised, even, even remended, uh, even remedy, my bad, by more and greater audacity. Image, the lion and the hare. The lion creates no gaps in his way. His movements are too swift, his jaw too quick and powerful. The timid hare will do anything to escape, to escape danger. But in his haste to retreat and flee, it backs into traps, hops smack into the enemy's jaws. Authority. I certainly think that it is better to be Im impetuous and uh, impetuous than cautious. For fortune is a woman, and it is necessary. If you wish to master her, to conquer her, to conquer her by force, and it can be seen that she lets herself be overcome by the bold rather than those who proceed court, uh, coldly, and therefore, like a woman. She is always a friend to the young because they are, they are less cautious, fiercer, and master her greater audacity, master her with greater audacity. Nikolai Machiavelli, 1469 to 1527. The reversal. Boldness should never be the strategy behind all your actions. It is a tactical instrument to be used at the right moment. Plan and think ahead and make the final element the bold move that will bring you success. In other words, since boldness is a learned response, it is always, it is also one that you learn to control and utilize at will. To go through life armed only with audacity will be tiring and also fatal. You will offend too many people. As is proven to be, excuse me, as is proven by those who cannot control their bones. One such person was Lola Montez, where her audacity brought her triumphs and led to her seduction of the king of uh, Bavaria. But since she could never reign in her boldness, it also led to her downfall in Bavaria, in England, 
wherever she turned. It crossed the border between boldness and the appearance of cruelty, even insanity. Ivan the Terrible suffered the same fate. When the power of boldness brought him success, he stuck to it, to the point where it became a life, a lifelong pattern of violence and sadism. He lost the ability to tell when boldness was appropriate and when it was not. Timidity is no place, has no place in the realm of power. You will often benefit, however, by being able to feed it. Timidity has no place in the realm of power. You will often benefit, however, by being able to feed it. Fiend. F-E-I-G. F-E-I-G. Fiend. F-E-I-G. Fiend. F-E-I-G. Fiend. Fiend, to represent by false appearance, simulate, to pretend, fiend, a sham, fictitious, fraudulent. By being able to represent by false appearance, Hmm. Timidity has no place in the realm of power. You will often benefit, however, by being able to, able to pretend, by being able to be fictitious, to simulate it, by being able to sham it, by being able to represent by false appearance it, hmm. by being able to fraudulent it. Timidity has no place in the realm of power. You will often benefit, however, by being able to feed it. At that point, of course, it is no longer timidity, but an offensive weapon. You are luring people in, in your show of shyness, all the better to pounce on, on them boldly later. <laughs> that was Law 28. Law 28. Interaction with boldness. Law 28. Interaction with boldness. Judgment. If you are unsure of your course of action, do not attempt it. Your doubts and hesitations will infect your execution. Timidity is dangerous. Better, you, better to enter with boldness. Any mistakes you commit through audacity are easily corrected with more audacity. Everyone admires the bold. No one honors the timid. Law 28. So that's Law 28. We're going to come back next time and read Law 29. Law 29. That's next up on the list. Plan all the way to the end. Law 29. Let's see how long it is. How long? 44 minutes. This one's not that long. Yeah, I'll come back with Law 29 next time. Law 29 and maybe Law. Yeah, Law 29. Yeah, we'll read Law 29 next time. Plan all the way to the end. This has been the 48 Laws of Power uh, by Robert Greene, a Joyce Elfer's book. So uh, we're going to keep going. We're over halfway through the book. We're over halfway through the book. We're going to keep going. I got to get another dictionary. I hate looking up words and I can't find them. And then later on, we'll come back and read Dr. Sheryl's out of these book, the black one, the black woman's guide to understanding the black man. Came in the mail. Can't wait to dive into this one. 
But that's for another time. Another book for another time. Let's finish this one first, and we'll move on to the next one. Shalom, shalom, everybody. Shalom. Shalom. We'll keep reading, and we'll keep learning. Shalom. Shalom.